I'm the head of economics at Schumacher College uh, in Devon, and I also teach um, a, a program called uh, Gaia Education, which is um, uh, a curriculum to practice in eco villages around the world. Um, and we never, I mean, I don't think I've ever taught me standing at the front and people in rows. <laughs> I've only ever, ever uh, shared in a circle. So I'm, I'm going to invite you. You know, we happy few who are left to form a circle so that we're actually in a circle because it will facilitate the conversation. Everyone okay being filmed? Everyone okay being filmed? Any objections? You object, sit next to me in the way. Um, I, I know. I see that there's um, there's a number of you who have been here for a while, and um, I, I'm just going to wait for everybody to come. And as a general, as a general principle in teaching, if you speak for more than 20, 20 minutes in, in a go, people generally stop listening. And I'm aware that some of you have been sitting here for at least the last hour. So I'm really wondering how productive this is going to be if we start immediately. So what I'm going to suggest is, and I really don't want to lose you, but I think, I think it will be much more useful to all of us if you take a five minute stretch, do something else, um, do some brain gym, do go to the pub, whatever. But really, it is now a quarter past, come back at 20 past and um, have a... Can you, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Because there's so much extra. Okay, so um, let's let's hope that by beginning the conversation, others will see it and that come along. Um, so j just to begin, um, so it, this is oh, this is going to work. Good. Okay, so just to begin, and uh, let's just very quickly we could spend the entire time doing just this, but let's just go around hearing. Uh, where you're from and why on earth you're doing an economics workshop where there's so much good dance music. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, my name's Sunil. I'm just here to, I guess, get more ideas and inspiration on how we can make things different because it's necessary. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm here because I'm interested in um, enabling the development of communities into business infrastructure to redistribute funds from recommissioning them from source. So drawing down funding from state and recommissioning from the institutes that are currently in place. Um, redirecting that into the development of a health and social well-being infrastructure and pulling that together into a community focus. Um, on a global documentary uh, project and we've made a film which is about positive solutions and we're organising a, a sort of gathering sort of symposium next year and we're looking to uh, gather together people talking about economy so that's why I'm here. Let's, let's stop. Are you just here to film? <laughs> I'm, I'm also quite interested. Uh, yeah my name's Bill, I've um, got a long term interest in economics and I'm quite um, in systems theory of economics and I'm trying to get a research group together. Um, I'm not a university but just interested people. I've probably said enough on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in the economics bit of it because it's the fundamental bit that we need to solve to make the rest of it work. No. No. I'm, I'm, I'm Paris. I'm here. I want to learn. Yeah. Yeah, say hello. That's many. <laughs> oh, well, I, I was just checking out your bikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to make my child see. Why are you here? Why are you here? She's drinking her tea. Whoa, oh, you're pulling the leg out. <laughs> Too far. You have to come closer. Do you know which one it plugs in? I can take a guess.
Is that working? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so I'm just going to go. Um, so um, the, 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 the title of the talk is The Economics of the 21st Century. Maybe just one, uh, one word of introduction. Uh, when I teach at Schumacher, there's a year-long program at Schumacher. There's also short courses. And when I teach in guy education programs, um, there's one way I often like to start the class. And this is, a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a one minute piece of film and it's called Awareness Test. And uh, it looks like something out of West Side Story. This is two groups of kids wearing jeans and some have got white t-shirts and some have got black t-shirts. And the continuity announcer's voice says, how many, it's frozen, the image is frozen. How many teams, how many passes does the team in white make? And you follow the ball and it's really easy. And you can, and then it freezes and the voice says, the answer is 13, which is easy to calculate. But did you see the moonwalking bear? And then it rewinds and you see it played again. And while the ball is going, this guy comes through wearing a gorilla suit doing a Michael Jackson <laughs> moonwalk dance. And nobody sees it because it's not what you're looking for. And um, I think it's probably obvious why, why I show that is that, that um, the way evolution works in both biological, physical systems and in social and economic systems is that for very long periods not much happens. And then there is a crisis and the crisis in biological systems is often associated with climate change and then all hell breaks loose. And there is massive innovation and new solutions, new experiments open up um, and particularly in moments like this, and we are in one such moment at the moment, the language and the stories that we inhabit are not adequate to the moment. They're lagging way behind the excitement of the moment. So the language that we're using at the moment and the stories that are mirrored back to us by the media, it's not that they're untrue, but they're, they're, they're stuck in telling stories associated with the old dying paradigm and there is so much fertility happening that is under the radar of the dominant narrative as told to us by the, as fed back by the media system. Now, I personally do not feel there's a conspiracy here. I think it's simply, it is the perennial story. If you think of 16th century um, Italy, when Copernicus turns up and says, you know, I know that your entire worldview, your entire cosmic understanding is based on the sure knowledge which all of you have that the Earth is at the center of the universe. However, guys, it's wrong. <laughs> it's not. And the and and of course, they wanted to kill Galileo because to 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 actually to deprive people of meaning is is it's the most heinous crime. And so what's happening at the moment is we're at one of these moments of Copernican shifts and the stories and the language embedded deep within the language we're using and the stories fed back to us by the media are the old ways of doing things. And it seems to me that, that uh, I, I actually have little doubt. Well, we're going through a very tight bottleneck at the moment and it's possible we may not get through as, a, as an industrial civilization or as an evolved civilization. But if we do, I'm pretty convinced that our kids and grandkids will say to us, wow, you lived through that period. You lived through that astonishing period. And most of us will kind of go, well, I guess we did. You know, like they say, um, if you can remember the 1960s, you probably weren't there. I mean, it, was, it, it feels a little bit like that at the minute, but it seems to me that, that uh, and, and, and this is really what I want to talk about, is the, the ways in which, um, to, to join up the dots differently, to tell a different narrative from the one that's actually being told using the dominant language within the dominant paradigm in the dominant media systems. Um, and just before launching into the substance of this, I want to um, remind you that the term the Industrial Revolution wasn't coined until a hundred years after, in retrospect, the process could be seen to have begun. So the people living through the Industrial Revolution were completely unaware that history would look at this moment in the late 18th century as being of you know, seismic significance for the entire development of civilization on Earth. They were completely unaware of it because the stories, the language, were, were the stories and the language of 
the 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 post feudal early industrial period they were living through and it simply didn't prepare them to join up the dots in the way that will become ob obvious in retrospect and it seems to me that if we can it's something that uh, we really encourage our students to do at Schumacher College is to become historians of the present to really look at the, this moment in history and to to intelligently I mean, and it's all educated guests because we don't know. We've, we, we live in a, in a in a fabulously complex, emergent world where really anyone who tells you they know what 2030 is going to look like will stop listening now because they don't know. Um, but can we use our intelligence and our intuition to distinguish between those trends in current society? but will be the headline makers in 2030 and those which will be mere footnotes if that. And what I'm going to share with you in the next 20 minutes or so, hopefully leaving time for a conversation around this, is what I come to, the, 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 the point that I come to when I try to be an historian of the present. Um, and it seems to me that this is extremely important. It's almost like a, a surfer watching waves coming in, that if you can distinguish the significant waves, you can avoid tumbling and you can you can surf in elegantly and and the the, the 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 world that is being born that I want to briefly describe for you is by no means inevitable but the more of us that see the potential and see this new story this new narrative the more likely it is that as intelligent activists lobbyists we will be able to help that birth process good so that's my way of introduction and the, so the, the, the story I want to tell, the, the, the way I want to join up the dots, is in the transition from 20th century forums to 21st century forums. So, uh, organizational forums. So 20th century organizational forums have been large-scale, centralized, top-down, command and control, pulling power and wealth to themselves. So think of political parties, think of corporations, Think of the welfare states, think of trade unions, large-scale mass movements that tend to be controlled by small groups of men sitting at the center pulling the strings. Now, it seems to me that not only has this generated many of the crises that we sit within, but this model is hopelessly ill-prepared to deal with an increasingly crisis-ridden, complex world. So if you, I mean, just to take one example, if you look at um, the 20th century model for food is the 20th century organizational form is Monsanto and Tesco. Large-scale organizations with small groups of, of men at the center trying to control and manage extended supply chains. In the face of crises associated with, with rising energy costs, with climate change, with water shortage, and on and on and on. Now this becomes progressively more difficult to manage from the center. So, and let's stick with food. That the 20th century form, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go sector by sector by sector, exploring the battle between the 20th century organizational form and the 21st century organizational form. In the food sector, the 20th century organizational form, Monsanto and Tesco have dominated the food sector. Now, what we're seeing today, and again, in each of these sectors, it's the new trying to be born, is new dispersed, decentralized, collaborative networks of food producers and processors. Now, in food, as in most other sectors, the, the emergence of the more dispersed, decentralized, collaborative, playful, community-based way of doing things is facilitated, is enabled to some degree by the internet, by the information technology revolution, but is not entirely dependent upon it. So let's look for example at Totnes, the town I live in, which does have a particularly evolved food culture. This in, in Totnes, in common with all the villages, towns, cities that you're from, on the one hand there are Consumers. There are delicatessens, there are hospitals, there are schools, there are restaurants, and increasingly, because of the rising awareness in our, in our uh, civilization, they're being asked, is this food local? 
increasingly answer question. And very often, traditionally, what they've said is, you know, we'd love to buy local, but the, the, the transaction costs involved in negotiating with 20 different local producers were simply too high. Whereas if we go to the supermarket, we make one purchase, and so alas, because we don't have a whole team of administrators, that's what we have to do. Now today, this is changing, and we're seeing the emergence of food hubs, which are a number of different business models, but one being the food hub, which provides uh, uh, a convenient, user-friendly internet interface, storage and refrigeration facilities, and uh, processing facilities to convert, for example, milk into higher produce, yogurt, cheese, for example. And these are enabling multiple dispersed small-scale producers who are deeply embedded in their own bioregion and have a local loyalty to, 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 to both get the market intelligence very quickly as to what the demand is and to respond to it in a collaborative way. So, for example, one organization that is riding this wave is Riverford. And we buy, as a family, we buy our food from Riverford and it's cheaper than the local supermarket because they're cutting out so many links in this extended global supply chain. You know, the, the, the advertising is minimal, the transport is minimal, minimal the packaging is minimal, and, and we return it. And so in the food sector, we're seeing, I mean, apart from the community-supported agriculture and the farmers markets and all the other food co-ops and other interesting ways that we're seeing this happening, we're seeing that the information technology is enabling a closing of the gap between the consumer and the dispersed collaborative network of producers and processors in ways that are making the latter model potentially profitable and in some cases actually profitable. So let's look at finance. The 20th century model for finance is of course the bank. Um, so through the 20th century, the bank has dominated the financial landscape increasingly. And again, we're, th th there, are, there are multiple seeds of the new that are, that uh, th th there's no lack of innovation. The challenge is in helping these to scale up and to actually go viral. But the, the most obvious alternative channel is peer-to-peer -peer lending, what, what is often called crowdfunding. So rather than drawing just on one source of needing to go to the spider at the center of the web who controls the entire system, being able to persuade others to contribute to your projects. And I think in, in many of these areas that uh, there is a need for critical legislation to enable the new forms of organization uh, to really help them on their way. And one of these has happened in the crowdfunding area where traditionally crowdfunding has been associated with grants. So, which means that, um, that if you, for example, you want to create a CD or you want to create a, a film, you'll get 100 people each contributing 100 pounds and then you give them different rewards. But they're, they're not buying a share, they're simply giving a gift because they think it's good. And re recent legislation in the US and Britain and several other countries uh, critical legislation now enables companies and social enterprises to sell equity to actually attract investors through crowdfunding. So really enabling it to step up to a different level. Um, similarly in the finance field, uh, a real proliferation of community currency type initiatives where communities are finding ways of, and communities, both communities of place and communities of interest, uh, are finding mechanisms to enable them to exchange between each other without going through the medium of the um, uh, of, of, of the bank and, and the national currency. So let's look at another sector. Um, one that I'm particularly interested in is public services. Um, I'm of a generation that was told unequivocally that the welfare state was a good thing. And I know it's almost heresy to question that, but I'm, I'm going to attempt it. Um, that, that for sure for those living in the, in the decades after the Second World War who remembered pre-war conditions and post-war conditions for sure, a more civilized, humane society. However, if you look at 
the, like those who study who we are as a species, the psychologists, the anthropologists, the neuroscience, who look deeply at who we are as a species, they will tell you that we are reciprocal, we are not resilient. And consequently, the, the, it seems to me that what happened with this noble venture uh, with, the, with the great post-war labor administrations is that much of the, the rich connectivity of mutualist community help Britain was simply washed aside by municipal socialism, where we became, rather than active participants, in designing and delivering and collaborating with our neighbors in creating a net that we became uh, mute recipients of a standardized service provided from the center. So again, the, the 20th century model, the welfare state, um, a, a small group of mostly men sitting at the center, scratching their heads, thinking, how on earth are we going to be able to continue to provide services, particularly with the demographic bubble coming up, that's going to see a halving of the number of people in work relative to each person of a retirement age by 2050. And, and, and given the complexity of the society, the, the, the trick is to, is to spread the intelligence is to call the in collective intelligence of the entire network of citizens and to turn us from passive recipients of public service into active collaborators in the design and delivery of public services. So the 21st century model links into uh, particularly the model of time banking, where people are earning time credits to uh, let, let, let me go to Japan, where, where this model, particularly for elder care, is in its most evolved form. Where um, uh, over 600,000 people are involved in this system of looking after their neighbours, and actually it is recognised by the state's insurance system. You can actually use this system uh, with, your, with your state insurance. The way it works is that, is that um, like 65 is the new 40. I don't know if you know many 65 year olds, but, but the idea that they make the retirement material is completely ludicrous. And, and uh, they're more than able to look after people who are, who have reached an age where really they're truly no longer able to look after themselves. So what happens in the Japanese case and increasingly around the world, it's really the Japanese took a big lead on it, but it's by no means restricted to Japan, is that people who are older, but they're no longer in formal jobs, but they're more than able to look after other people, look after people who are no longer able to look after themselves, and in return earn time credits which they can cash in when they get to an age when they really need help. Um, and the research, unsurprisingly, given who we are as a species, shows that the, the, the happiness and longevity of both the, care, the person cared for and the carer improves, uh, and um, when given a choice between a state provision and the, the time credit system, people tend to go for the time credit system because it builds relationship. Um, in the early time bank model, a guy called Edgar Kahn created time banks, and he was delighted at the beginning to find that up to 60% of the credits were never cashed in. And they were never crashed in because people who were doing the work realized that, of course, this is who we are as a species, this is what we love doing, this makes us human, looking after other people. And so they actually didn't need the reward, but you needed the scheme to rebuild the social fabric that has been so eroded. Um, Time Bank in London has um, persuaded companies to take their second-hand comp their, their computer equipment that they were previously putting into the landfill, take it out of the landfill and donate it to the, to the time bank. Young people are then trained in how to repair the computers and earn time credits with which they can buy the, compu they can buy the computers. Um, local schools in disadvantaged areas, kids earn time credits for being mentors to younger kids. The academic performance of the mentors improves, the academic performance of the mentor improves, the rates of bullying in the school drop, and the kids get access to computer equipment. It's using the, the it's calling on the, the, 
the, the dispersed intelligence throughout the system rather than depending on a group of usually men sitting at the center trying to control an increasingly crisis-ridden and complex world. Let's take one more sector. I mean, really, we could go sector by sector by sector through the... Through any sector, any sector you're particularly interested in, we could explore. Agriculture. Um, great. Wow. So the, the 21st century, the 20th century model, once again, is Monsanto, because they not control the entire food chain, including uh, the production. Um, so the 20th century model is... Um, the Green Revolution is huge monocultural plantation, is massive application of fertilizer and, and untold environmental and social, what are called externalities. Huge costs that are picked up not by the consumer. So no such thing as cheap food, just food where other species, poor people on the other side of the world and future generations are picking up a big part of the town. Now this is clearly unsustainable, uh, and given, given the, again, the length of the supply chains and the, the progressively more difficult, greater difficulty in managing those supply chains from the center, the 21st century model is agroecology, small scale producers, again enabled by the, enabled by the internet to reduce the distance, reduce the transaction costs involved, in communicating directly with the with the consumer, it's a much longer story, but that's headline. Okay, so the, the the general pattern is that it seems to me that across our society, look at politics. It's not that people have stopped being interested in in, in politics. It's that the Westminster, the conventional model of large scale political parties dominated by men trying to control from the centre, is much less interesting than the dispersed, networked, again, linked into this as 21st century model of communications is television and newspapers. 21st century model is the blogosphere, much more interesting. And, and enabling us to communicate with each other and to draw on our collective intelligence that isn't dependent on the mediation of large scale, powerful, deadening organizations. So I, I'm, I'm going to stop in, in just a moment, but just a, as, as a resume, saying that the future is already here, it's just not terribly evenly distributed. Um, and so to, to, be, to get stuck in thinking, continually using the future tense, assuming that we're currently stuck and wondering how we can get out of this mess, to be open to the possibility that actually there is already huge dynamism in the system and sector by sector by sector in the economy, uh, the economy and society, new ways of doing things are already emerging and a whole new vast language, everything from crowdfunding to crowdsourcing to couch surfing, 20th century model, the anonymous hotel, 21st century model, um, crowd surfing and friend based making friendships uh, while you do a form of tourism that engages I, I just, maybe I just sit here and do this um, so that, so what I want to suggest is that really um, rather than getting depressed about how badly stuck we are and wondering how unstuck we can get is just to look around in a new way to see can we join up the dots in a way that we can actually see that, that already the world that will be deeply recognizable to our children and grandchildren is already profoundly in the process of being born? Um, and that by seeing it in that way, it will, we become less disempowered and better able to speed it on its birth journey. So I'm just going to hit the pause button for a minute and invite any kind of a conversation. Again, it's not question and answer, it's conversation. So please, the microphone can simply wander where it wants to go. I guess um, I was wondering what perhaps you might think about... Uh, recommissioning costs to supplement the development of such organization that encompasses a community. Um, whether or not that could be taken from source rather than 
managed through the current institutes and infrastructure that's in place. I'm wondering whether or not a grassroots institution can be born with individuals uh, focusing on health and social well-being and developing that by commissioning costs directly from source, not allowing them to go into external private endeavour, but into community ownership, and then redistributing those funds um, by offering tendered contracts, not only to business, but also to individuals within the community. Good. So, um, a, a couple of things come to mind immediately. Uh, one is I spent a decade living in Findhorn Eco Village, um, and something that um, we developed there that, that has gone much more, much more widely. I don't think Findhorn was the first to do this, but but it's gone much more widely. Is the idea of community share issues? So, for example, um, Findhorn is now a net exporter of electricity through its wind farm and much of the wind farm is owned by those of us who bought shares to actually enable that to happen. So increasingly we're seeing the rise, I mean I think this is often with crisis in the rural economy, with pubs closing and libraries closing and swimming pools closing, communities coming together and actually buying those assets and managing them collectively. Um, so that, that, that's one, one, one thought. The other thought that came to me is that we're also seeing a resurgence in the cooperative movement um, and a big, um, a, a big part of any local economy, particularly in deprived areas, but really any local economy, is expenditure by uh, local government and municipality on, on uh, hospitals and schools and um, other municipal offices. And um, a, a big route towards empowering, uh, to really driving local economies forward has been procurement, has been to to create, um, uh, th 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 there's a big experiment with the Evergreen Co-ops in, in Cleveland, Ohio at the minute, where um, workers' co-ops, a very deprived part of the states, workers' co-ops have been created, and the local university and um, um, hospitals are, are, are contracting to them for their laundry and um, electricity generation and other, and, and other needs, and, and uh, they, they're seeing a whole, uh, ecosystem of, of mutually supporting cooperatives emerging with a key um, kickstart driver being um, um, winning contracts for local government for local procurement. I guess, I guess um, part of it, I mean, going back to one of the bits that you are talking about earlier in terms of, um, you know, um, I think you were talking about business and how that sort of functions within community. I guess in some regard, what I'm considering is um, something uh, something more of a, a sort of business infrastructure that moulds itself around the community and essentially employs every member of that community to focus on the development of that community and the well-being of the people within that space. And in so doing, promoting the development of cottage industry and further business endeavours within that community and allowing those skills to grow, but working with the local currency to subsidise the cost of living at a local level so that people can essentially find a balance. Uh, but being encompassed within a business infrastructure, you can enable individuals to operate freely within the confines of the legal framework but within some regard, within private means, because it's encompassed within, within a private business infrastructure. In a similar way that businesses will allude to the truth, it's like within a community that is formed as a business, you could expect the same privilege, I would have thought. So I, I haven't entirely understood the question, but but insofar as it's about um, um, insofar as it's about people um, coming together and pooling their investment so as to create enterprises and indeed and ideally enterprises that are that are somehow networked and linked so they're mutually reinforcing, it, it is the future, I'm sure.
So any other conversation what happened? Do you know much about Bitcoin and what what that could do? <laughs> I, I don't. I, it's been in, it's been on my radar for a while, but I actually haven't researched it. Have you researched it? Um, all I do know is some kind of secure, decentralized way of trans having transactions. And I think it's semi anonymous, but open. So you, I think you can see all the accounts and transactions. You don't necessarily know who who has made them, <laughs> but it's beyond government and it's decentralised and it's secure and encrypted. So you say that. Um We've moved from the world of Monsanto and actually Walmart rather than Tesco, I would say. Um, and we are in the process of moving from that 20th century paradigm to some 21st century paradigm. Do you imagine that Walmart and Monsanto are just going to give up and go away? So, do I imagine Walmart and Monsanto will just give up and go away? <laughs> I do not. Um, um, a, a couple of things. One is that um, the, the the world that um, that, that, that it, it, for me it's clear that the um, that that there are seeds of new things happening that are generally below the radar of the stories that are being mirrored back to us. So we're not we're not seeing them as one coherent story in a way that I'm presenting. Um, but there is no inevitability that um, that that this will be the dominant the, the dominant organisation form of the 20th century. Two things. One is the huge vested interest of the current system, and the other is that while the internet has the power, while information technology definitely has the power to enable much more dispersed collaborative ways of working, it's also enabling the US military uh, and GCHQ to be even more uh, manipulative with, with, uh, with sensitive data. Um, but the, the, a reason why I see uh, grounds for hope is that with the like uh, right at the top when I talked about the food sector, I talked about the profitability of the current dominant organisational mode in the food sector to be dependent on things which are really disappearing. So they, they're the hugely water intensive, water become increasingly, increasingly scarce, increasingly are the hugely energy intensive at a moment when energy prices are bound to rise. Um, they're um, dependent on, um, on driving a loss of biodiversity um, and, and monoculture, which is also ecologically unsustainable. And I mean, so either we as a global community find a way of, of bringing in the carbon tax and, and, and re-regulating our economy in a way to make these activities more, more difficult, or it simply becomes more and more difficult for the people sitting at the centre of their offices in London, New York and elsewhere to actually manage the sheer complexity and growing crises associated with the current ways of doing things. So it seems to me that, um, that it will become progressively more difficult to manage things from the centre. Uh, just to join in, I mean one thing not to be, a lot of what you're saying, it, it, some people talk about the, um, the sharing economy and the co and collaborative consumption of things. And there is like, there's now a huge growth, you know, the biggest, most famous example is Airbnb and car sharing. So more and more people share cars, which is on rent cars to each other and stuff like that, which more than any eco car technology reduces the carbon impact of them. Like there's no technology that reduces the carbon by fourfold other than having three other people in the same car. Um, and there are loads of startups like Zipcar, loads, loads of quite successful big startups that have used social, you know, the internet to disrupt the car rental business. And, but most of them have now been bought by Hertz or by BMW or by... Um, so there is a danger that rather than giving up and going away, Tesco will start doing community support agriculture. 
<laughs> but, but I think that the the the, uh, the, the point is that the the, the the Tesco business model is incompatible with local with, with a vibrant local economy. I mean, the two are simply incompatible. It would not generate the economies of scale in which the their infrastructure would be would be. I, mean, I think uh, this is. I'm really glad you brought in this this point about uh, what the, this thing is called collaborative consumption. There's a book out there called Collaborative Consumption, which I strongly recommend, and it's tracing the many ways in which, um, sometimes driven by um, increased consciousness, sometimes driven by economic crisis, by household personal economic crisis that people are finding ways of, like a 20th century form of organization was ownership. A 21st century form of organization is access. So for example, I haven't owned a car in 15 years. I love driving um, and I've, I've got a young family and I actually need a vehicle, but I haven't owned one in 15 years because I've been a member of car carpools, um, which are much cheaper and much more um, convivial because on occasion, it doesn't happen often, but on occasion, uh, I go and find that actually in the time slot that I need the car, there isn't one available, and I have to phone around my community and, and negotiate with people in my community about who can help who. Maybe I could pick up the shopping, or you could pick up the kids, or, or whatever. And you know, this for me improves my quality of life. Um, some research in Britain showed recently that um, on av the average used life of a power drill is 22 minutes. <laughs> That's it. So the and, and, and I think that 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 I mean really I'm looking to youth culture and what I'm seeing and, and I don't think it's just because I want to see it is that is an ownership of things being profoundly uncool. It's like like owning all this stuff, uh, much of which is going so quickly into the landfill and which you don't need because because now again a growing number of internet sites that. Um, uh, we don't buy kids' clothes, we go to Kids Grow. And we get, we get our kids from there or from networks, collaborative networks of uh, in Totnes and, and, and around. So we don't need to buy kids' clothes, we don't not need to buy power drills, we don't need to buy cars. Um, and this all is adding fuel to the, the, the locally based, locally loyal, connected, dispersed, systems at a local level at the cost of the global system. Well, I mean, I guess my point is share scheme, like we do in London with the Boris bikes. That's great, that's all share bikes, but why does it have to be Barclays that benefit from all the free advertising from it? And why, why couldn't we give, you know, it hasn't happened, but conceivably we could have set up a nice multi-stakeholder car, which is everyone that owns bikes in London and everyone that lives in London and surrounding areas and, and a bunch of investors and all put the money together and purchased a load of bikes and done the same thing without the need for Barclays and Boris to do it for us and reap, you know, still siphon off a part of that value that we generate. Um, that's that we haven't done yet. But I think, I mean, I'm hopeful that we will go forward and learn more from these examples. Um, and yeah, who knows how it's going to unfold, like you keep saying. Um, it's something that we talked about a little bit earlier today, is that um, th th there is a tendency, I said that there's a growing resurgence in cooperatives and social enterprises, however, for the most part the operators of these, of these organisations tend to continue to see themselves as individual entrepreneurs rather than building networks of mutually reinforcing enterprises that are that, that are able to draw on collective resources and and really when I look at the great success stories of creating viable alternatives to the dominant capitalist model they're not cooperatives they're networks of cooperatives they're places like Mondragon in Spain where you've got multiple multiple co-ops that between them have created a bank, created a school, created research and development organizations that are, and so they've created an entire ecosystem of cooperatives. And we need this kind of power. The individual enterprise standing in its own is a small fish in a big pond with much bigger fish. Um, I just just want to share one anecdote specific in the um, to, to, to the, um, the carpools. I'm actually a bit agnostic about, on this one about ownership. I, I was uh, invited to, to um, uh, there was a festival called Wilderness Festival in Oxfordshire, 
and they do these debates. And I was invited to a debate with a guy, and they were always inviting people because they assumed they were going to shout at each other. So they really invited people who really fight spectacularly. And so they put me against this guy from Forum for the Future who was um, arguing, it was about the future of capitalism and the role of business in the transition. And they assumed that we'd really kick lumps out of each other. And actually we deeply listened to each other and both learned lots in the process to the degree that I actually invited him to come and teach the course I teach at Schumacher. But he, I mean, he, he gave me the example of carpooling and said, um, so you mentioned carpools, you know, in your eco-village you give training and you've provided training about running a carpool. And I said, yes. And he said, how many have, have been replicated as a result? <laughs> Which was a killer question. Because I said, I don't know, but I suspect very few, honestly. And he said, well, look, I mean, what has happened is an entrepreneur in the States has picked this up and he's created zip cars. And with the power for innovation and scale of the corporation, within two, three years, every city in the States has got a zip car. And that hurts the book. Hmm? That hurts the book. In, in other words, at the moment, I find myself somewhat agnostic. Like, I'm, I find that interesting and I'm not so wedded. I mean, in the, in the long term, I do want to see networks of social enterprises that are mutually supporting um, I, I see that as being the shape of the new economy but as part of the transition if the corporation is able to find a niche and scale up in a way that we communities are not able to I personally I find myself interested oh, there's hundreds of things I could be <laughs> talking about now um, I think the key word for me in what you have said um, about the mushrooming of, and the word is alternative ways of living, okay, is that many people here, most people here probably, uh, do consider these things as alternatives that you can somehow or other turn away from the, the Monsantos and the Walmarts and live in a different way without replacing the social and economic and political system that sustains and is sustained by the now global corporation. Uh, but the problem is that the global corporations which produce for profit are required to grow. They have to grow, by that's the dynamic of capitalism. And so one of the ways that they're growing is by invading the mushrooming alternative ways of producing that we've been talking about. So if you talk about access by, rather than ownership, of course this is now the predominant um, business model for Microsoft, which have changed from selling you their operating system, Microsoft XP or Vista, whatever it is, or um, uh, Word or Office. They don't sell you Office. As of this year, they lease you Microsoft 365. And you don't own it. You have access to it, and you'll have to buy it again next year at that lease and they tie you into their brand forever because you can become, you adopt it, you either get tied into um, uh, Apple or you get tied into Microsoft and it's a, it's a way of, of seducing you to become part of their consumer base. So Mike, uh, come back to the question I asked you, you know, what do we do about Monsanto? Monsanto has been in the killing business, that's what they set up to do in their early days in the 40s that's what they, from, from the 40s to today, they're in the business of killing. And they produce and buy uh, the copyright on patents on all the seed that they can get their hands on and then stop it developing and prevent farmers replanting it. Now, this is the killing business. So and rather than saying, well, they're going to find it too difficult to continue because they're destroying the environment, we have to say now, before they destroy our ecosystems, how do we replace them? How do we gain control of the resources that they have, return, the, uh, return to farmers around the world the right to replant the seed that they grow, because they've never lost that. So we have to change the social, political and economic model now, not just allow them to fall away, because they're going to kill us before they fall away. So I, I substantially agree with that. Um, I think the, the, the good news is there's no technological inevitability here. We have to continue to be ethically driven, politically aware citizens, making choices. Um, but the technology does open up intriguing new possibilities for doing it differently and better. Um, so it certainly isn't, um, it doesn't uh, uh, exempt us from the 
need to continue to be engaged as political citizens, but it's simply being aware of the opportunities that are there opens up new vistas. I've got sort of a nice story about how we, it's relevant I think. I'm part of a, a co-op, a multi-stakeholder co-op called the Eco Land Co-op. And their plan is, you know, they want to replace the industrial agriculture model. And they want to support the people that want to start low impact, small holding, agroecological farms. So they buy agricultural land and they get planning for low impact development and then they sell leases as cheap as possible so that they can still break even. So they just, they're in the process of selling the first three leaseholds for £72,000 each uh, for our site, not too far from here in Somerset Devon Borders. Um, but a friend of mine said, well, okay, how much will it take to buy back the whole country? Because like, that's sort of where we need to get to. <laughs> and. You know, have you done some? So I was like, actually, no, I haven't. Now, does this scale was the kind of question he was asking. It's sort of, I think, partly what you're saying, without changing the bigger political and economic systems. You know, and I did a few sums, and if, you know, if everyone aged 16 and over in the whole country, which is 38 and a half million people, roughly, all put 6p, just 6p a day, into a pot, we could buy all of the ecological agricultural land in the country that is for sale in any one year. The problem is very little of it is for sale in any one year. Uh, roughly for the last few decades it's been about 0.3% of it. So even if we did succeed in buying every little bit that is for sale and getting it into EK small holdings it would still take us 314 years or something to buy it all back. Um, Personally, I want to see that sort of change happen a lot, a lot, lot faster than that. So I think, yeah, my heart is in starting cooperative community enterprises, and, and I am starting a network, cooperative network, not just a co-op, um, which is going to be a big part of this solution, I hope. But I, parallel to that, I think we need to be much more politically active citizens, and we need to take, you know, people say, oh, it's never going to work. We can never elect a better party. Bollocks, we have to, and we're going to. Alternatively, we simply divert the common agricultural policy funds to um, <laughs> to the population. Yeah, and just picking up on doing things fast, like you said earlier that no one can predict the world in 2030, but um, if we carry on as business as usual, you know, the looming climate change disaster, yeah. Like in 2007, the government report on climate change came out, and like it was accepted that it's happening. But now today, like nothing's really happening. And like, so what are your thoughts on getting things done quickly when we're looming climate change disaster? Um, I, I think it's absurd to say that nothing is happening. Um, that um, we. Um, um, like, let, let's be historians of the present and look back with, give us some historical perspective that at the moment, like, one of the things that is happening is that senior investors, including Warren Buffett and a number of people around him, are naming the carbon bubble. They're saying that the share value of all the energy companies in the stock exchange are dependent on burning the oil in their reserves. However, if we burn the oil in our reserves, the planet thrives. And, and every country in the world has committed to legally binding targets for bringing their emissions down uh, to give us a chance of remaining at under two degrees. Don't want to get too technical about this, but the Paris Conference 2015, governments have committed to legally binding targets. And that will mean that in the region of two thirds to three quarters of the declared oil, the declared coal, oil, gas reserves of the fossil fuel companies can't be burned. Now, senior investors are talking amongst themselves and talking with governments and saying there's a massive carbon bubble here and the, these, the, the stock market price of these companies is based on the value of assets that they can never realize. Um, and, um, and moreover, one in every seven pension fund pound is invested in these funds. I mean, this is a massive would have a massive domino effect through the entire economy. Now this is being recognized and discussed by senior policy makers and financiers. Um, and um, when I read of um, and listen into 
what the folk with uh, economic, political clout in the current system, <laughs> they, they, like, they're reading the same stuff as we're reading. And they're going, holy shit. And, um, and you know, they, they, they're, they're I, I mean, it seems interesting to me that this one financial domino, the one of this carbon bubble, is critical in terms of the choice coming up. And it's a choice that is not being considered by uh, not just people sitting in fe festivals like this, but in Global, in Davos and elsewhere. So I think things are moving very fast. Um, so in response to that point, if we've got a carbon bubble and if we've got a whole load of global assets and values that aren't realizable, that aren't burnable, how do we transition from here to there? How do we wipe off and how do we say to all these companies, hey, it's okay, we recognize that we screwed up, there's a carbon bubble. They need an exit route and we need to give them an exit route. Is that the way out of it? And if it is, what does that exit route look like? So a lot of thought has been given to this because it's kind of being recognized not just in so-called alternative circles, but right at the heart of power, it's been recognized that this is, this is a major crisis ready to pop. Um, so um, um, one uh, series of exit strategies is being designed at the Schumacher College Economics for Transition Masters program to come along. Um, I mean, honestly, what it would look like, how it's looked like in the past, how this has happened, um, it is in the nature of money systems that are that are um, money systems that are based on uh, money created with compound interest. It is in the nature of these systems. It's not an accidental flaw in the system. It is systemically in the nature of these systems that they end up with a very small number of people, hugely rich, and almost everybody else impoverished. Um, David Graeber uh, wrote a wonderful book a few years back called Debt, The First 5,000 Years, where he described the historical record. And actually what happened was jubilee, that every so often wise kings came to power and they simply cancelled the entire debt. And the reason they did that is that the people who were enslaved would escape. They were indentured laborers and be effectively the only thing they had left to sell was themselves. And they would escape periodically into the forests and then would swoop down and simply raise the entire town and eat the rich. And so the wise kings defused the situation by simply cancelling the debt. Um, and it seems to me that, the, I mean, the way this happens is either you enable, you allow runaway inflation to simply knock off the real value of, uh, the, the real value of money, uh, or you have a jubilee. I mean, I don't see any other way. But here, the real problem, the real problem for the society is it's not just the rich. It's anyone who has any kind of asset that links at all to the stock market, pensions, so many of the other insurance systems are linked into the bubble. So if, if, if we devalue that bubble, pensions get written off as well. So it's a, it's a profoundly, it's a moment of great crisis stroke opportunity. Um, uh, output of uh, rice per hectare is being achieved by a small group of farmers in uh, Bengal who have adopted um, uh, really permaculture ideas, uh, which is about focusing on the plant and uh, the, um, creating the best possible conditions for the plant. And they use a small amount of uh, uh, boating fertilizer, but not very much. But at the same time, there are 40,000 families in a, uh, a, a refugee camp in Kenya because the Ethiopian government told them that uh, they were going to be rehoused in new villages because their land was being handed over to global corporations to develop further the Green Revolution, which, with all due respect to the, uh, the Schumacher philosophy, continues nonetheless to be the preferred uh, agricultural development project of both the World Bank and the United Nations. The same uh, agricultural model that has is in the process of creating dust bowls yet again in the United States at this very moment. So we are we are we are in the grip of a profound contradiction, and uh, contrary to 
our friend here, I would say that if we believe that the center of power has it covered and the corporations are now increasingly aware of where we are, I think that would be a real mistake on our part to believe that. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Rio summit. Uh, I'm old enough to have read Silent Spring uh, when it first came out. And I have followed these developments extremely closely. And from then till now, 20 years on from the first Rio summit, the actual, uh, whatever governments have said, the driving force continues to be the model whereby you have a system of production which must continue to grow in order to support increasing shareholder value every year. So when Sainsbury says, well, we've only made a billion pounds this year, you go, oh, well, that's okay. No, it's not, it's a disaster, because they made two billion the year before, and they must continuously grow in order to extract from the surplus value of both the world's resources and the labor expended on them, they must continue to hand that money to shareholder value. Let me give you an example. We have the highest rail fares in Europe. 90% of the money made by train companies in this country is given to shareholders, including pension funds and others who own shares in the railways. 10% is reinvested in those in, in the rail infrastructure. So this is a rapacious system which cannot, with the best will in the world, stop being rapacious. Because precisely, as was explained, the pension funds and so on are only interested in income. So they create this huge credit bubble which has now crashed. And what's happened? Your pension's bloody worthless anyway. So the pension funds, you know, stuck to this model, this capitalist model, and it still destroyed our pensions. I know, I've seen mine. So, you know, what we need to do is not assume that Obama, he's the most powerful person in the world, isn't he? And his mates have it covered. We have to create conditions where these amazing things that are happening, like this rice grower, become the prevalent model and not models out on the fringes so that the professor of agriculture in New York State who is developing fantastic perennial grains, you know, which can save, really save the soil from degeneration, but he's completely starved of funds. Whilst Monsanto continue to try to stop people from growing from seeds that they themselves have collected. So, you know, I think leaving it to them, then they've got it covered and it's all fine, you know, because the corporations know. They do know, but they still can't stop doing it. They know we should switch to renewables, but they still can't stop taking the stuff out of the ground. That's why they're drilling in beautiful Balkan East Sussex and the English middle classes are up in bloody arms over it and are, have got a climate cap outside this drilling site. So this is this this we need to develop an alternative political paradigm and fight for it. And not accept that there'll be some peaceful transition, we'll all be fine, because they've got it covered. So that's my toughest one. So um just finishing. Um just to say that I didn't hear anybody remotely say that we should wait for them to sort. That certainly wasn't what I was saying. Um, so, I, I mean, in conclusion, the, the, um, just like a comment to go away with is, is it seems to me that, um, that, that it may well be, I can certainly find it very feasible, the story that my kids and grandkids will look back to this moment as being a moment when lots of new organizational forms that were much more dispersed and collaborative um, and drawing on the intelligence, the intelligence innate within the system that, that this was the seedbed, this period was the seedbed. And it's simply a period of these new organizational forms that given the range of crises that are emerging that will only deepen, that will make it more and more difficult for the corporations and the large scale organizational forms to continue to thrive. And that these are the new organizational forms that we will co-create as we go forward.
we, we have to wrap up this particular discussion. Did you want to say something? Two words. Two words. Yeah. They're not the two words I'm thinking, are they? No, they're not. Are you sure one's not off? No, 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 they're all good. My words are social community. That's what we had before. We don't need pension funds. We need to be people together, don't we? And um, look after our own. Look after who we are. Short, sweet, to the point. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I just want to uh, say uh, thank you very much to, to Jonathan and uh, coming to give a perspective on things, a positive perspective uh, in terms of the unsustainability of the current model and the corporate model and uh, the fact that there are people genuinely looking at new forms of economies. Would that be right, uh, correct to say? Kind of. So can we give a round of applause to Jonathan Dawson, please, ladies and gents? Great stuff. So we've come to um, an odd point. Uh, we're programmed to do a, an open mic um, for the next hour before we talk direct democracy. And uh, and there are a few people, there are some um, great singers and performers here who'd probably like to perform. Uh, one issue that we have is that this mic is uh, great for speakers, but not necessarily great for singers and things like that. So we're gonna have to have a think about what we're gonna do there. Um, so can you bear with us for a moment or two while we find out who's here to perform, who needs a mic, who might need a plug-in for a guitar, and I'm not sure of the mixing situation either.